the Grey Hat Beard podcast. And um, welcome back to uh, episode three, part two of uh, Grey Hat Beards. And we're going into discussion mode. And today, as I just mentioned at the end, the last one, we're talking about problems with DevOps in a non-agile world. We're going to cover three topics as we go through uh, about seven or eight minutes each. And we'll kick off with Gary. And you're going to talk about building trust and confidence through DevOps. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of from the uh, conversation we had last week uh, about the work that I was doing with a, a client um, who was um, just unsure as to what was really going on with the uh, development that we were doing. Um, you know, we don't do magic or anything like that, but, uh, you know, it, it was they just didn't have the visibility um of, of what we were actually going. doing so yeah so so effectively what was happening was the, a meeting had happened and we'd say it, you know customer would be like oh can you do these changes well like yeah okay we'll go away and we'll do this and that was it it'd be kind of this void and then some new features would just appear um but there was no way of knowing well okay what's been tracked what's been tested um what uh, have any issues been raised? How have we fixed them? Those kinds of things, rather than just presenting uh, features. So, um, what I did was um, we were using um, uh, we started to use DevOps to uh, build up some uh, business context for the work that we were doing. So, uh, taking a look at so when you say DevOps, you mean Azure DevOps? Uh, Azure DevOps, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, Azure DevOps as a system, yeah. To so we basically took what we've been built and we created user stories from this. So it's kind of like refactored um, the, the, the business requirements to basically have a starting point for um, having discussions so that when we were having the discussions with the customer, then they were going into DevOps against a, um, like a user story um, and we'd track the discussion in there and say, okay, this is the expected behavior of, of, of this user story. Um, we'd then create test cases to then say, okay, how do we verify that this is going to work against the acceptance criteria that, that you've given us? And then as we were doing the development, we would um, create, a, um, create a branch, uh, a, a code branch in, uh, in DevOps, um, which linked it to that work item. So you could automatically see that, okay, there's been some work done on this work item. Here's a branch where the work is being done. We would use a pull request system to uh, like have a review. Um, that would also be be, be tracked. Um, and then um, the code change would be, be made. But from the, from the customer's perspective, they could go to a, essentially a business requirement and see the history of, okay, this is the code change that was made in the system. Um, and, and when it was was uh, made, oh, and now actually there's a load of tests here as well. So how do we test this? Well, we go to a test case that we've created and linked to it. Um, it has the expected, uh, it has the steps with the expected outcomes. We can then say, actually, we're going to run a test it using Azure DevOps test plans and go through those steps. And then we can confirm and pass our own and, tests. And those those test plans are the manual tests. So they are the kind of proper way of doing it instead of an excel sheet uh, yeah yeah so um originally it was done in excel spreadsheet it was difficult to manage there's no tracking in there whatsoever you're just updating values in a in a cell with um uh, the Azure devops we were able to create individual test cases so this is the test case here are the steps here's what's expected put the detail in there um and then in um, as your test plans, we could create different test suites. So we had a test suite for dev testing, and then we had a test suite for UAT testing. So the idea then is that we as a development team would do some dev testing against our dev, dev, uh, dev tenant um, and uh, go through the steps and record, yeah, it, we passed this test and, and we've passed it in our test suite. Then I could hand it over to the customer and say, in your UAT test suite, these are the test cases that you can now 
retest. So I basically go in, mark them as being active. They'd be able to go in, go to their test environment and then do the test runs, prove that it's actually worked, then we can so, close the work out. So you covered, and, and you've used quite a few kind of technical, come say, you know, pull requests and things like that. Obviously, people who are developers will will get those and uh, and using DevOps and, and pieces on that. What, what's, how, how did you communicate this out to to the client? Because were, were they techie people or were they on the, the more business side? No, um, so they're, they're definitely on the business side. Um, it was essentially a walkthrough. Uh, we I gave them access to um, the, the the team project where all this work is being tracked, and um, so that they can see um, the you know work items on boards, user stories, open them up, have a look, uh, and I basically just walked them through the process. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't so much them being able to see the code; it was that reassurance that you had structured things well. It was that yes. confidence that really brought through the thing. So it, yes. it's not that it, not all of them are going to understand that this test that works out that when you increment this and do the complete techie stuff here, yeah. what it was was the confidence that they had lots of greens, that they had a load of test plans, they could see where the failures and they could feed into that as well. That that was the big winner, was it? Yeah, it's, it's the feedback more than anything else. So, yes, it's great that you can see this individual line was changed from, yep. from a code perspective, and that's great. But really, from a business point of view, you don't care what code has changed. What you, what you care about is, has say, you've raised a defect. Have you been able to verify that that defect has been resolved? And what process have you gone through to prove that everything is still working as it was before? Um, and, and, and it can be a trust thing if you're just having a conversation. Um, yep. But with DevOps, you're doing the work in a system that's tracking everything for you, which is building up all of this history. So it's not extra work. Um, it, it, it's really helping you to say to a customer, Look, here's the whole life cycle of this piece of work that we've done. So, Gary, did you did you set up all of the tests as part of the initiation of the project, or were you setting up tests in response to issues that were raised either through internal testing and then through user acceptance testing, and then working that way? Yeah, so it was uh, test cases written as we were doing the work. Um, so, uh, give an example of uh, the uh, there was some UAT testing that was done, and a defect was raised uh, from a test case. Actually, the test case that um, that um, was used to find the bug, the steps that were taken were actually different steps. So it was a case of well, actually, that test case was fine. You've just gone through some other steps that another test case should have fulfilled. Therefore, there's actually a bit of a gap. So when the bug was raised, uh, again, um, rather than just raising the bug directly, I actually created the test case to replicate the bug. Oh, okay. So so your test case becomes your reproduction, uh, your, uh, yeah, your repro steps. Um, and you can say, well, this is what my expected outcome is. We would run that test as a dev team first and go through the steps and go, actually, step three is where we've got our issue. Um, and we can fail it on step three and put some commentary around that to say, actually, what we got was this other behavior. We got an error. But then we can raise a bug from the test case. And this keeps everything linked then because, OK, you, um, you've had your test run from this test case. This has raised a bug. This has gone into the backlog. This bug is now going to be worked on by someone in the dev team. Once that's been worked on, done our code changes, verified that you know we've we've actually solved it. We can run the test case again. So we go from red to green. So it, I think the the big takeaway from that is is that visibility. It's building trust through visibility of what you're doing because quite often for business people not understanding the code and not understanding the detail on it and and shouldn't have to they they can lose trust quite easily. I, th I think the other way and uh, I think Al you're going to jump onto this is how how do you building trust is making sure you understand what it is the business wants pulling together that initial backlog. 
And I think that's why the question around when do you build the test cases, you know, because that's always a challenge, isn't it? When you when you want to actually define what you're going to deliver as part of a project, you know, people talk about an MVP, and I don't mean Gary, I mean a minimum <laughs> viable product. You know, what he, is he's what the is, MVP, not an MVP? The, uh, <laughs> yeah. so that's a very good distinction. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you you know, often when we're talking to clients and we're saying, actually, do we want to define what we're going to deliver as a document or as a set of epics, features, user stories? The latter is obviously much harder for clients to understand if they haven't come from an agile background. Mm. Yeah. And it's also it plays into you know what Gary was talking about in terms of documentation. You know. If I want to get a client to sign off on, well, this is the scope of what we're going to deliver, I need to be able to communicate what epics are, features are, user stories are, get that baseline. And, and why as well. Yeah. I, I think it's important. The, ba the baseline of it so that a client can then look at it and go, we agree that's what you should be delivering for us is an absolutely crucial step because very few times are we going to be in a situation where we can just say, well, actually, we've got a finite amount of time. We'll deliver what we can do because most clients will be paying for outcomes, not just for the effort, um, which is uh, it makes for an interesting challenge when you need to define things and go, well, actually, this is the backlog, but only these items are flagged as being delivered within this time scale. And I, I think that brings neatly on to uh, the, the kind of final topic we're going to talk about that is it, given this and it, we all work in a consultancy, we we go out and we work with clients, uh, we're generally more on the, the delivery side, often get involved in pre-sales and, and you go in there and I, I think all of us would love to sit with an agile, say, just give us, give us a load of time. We've got a rough steer on what's been going. Let's have regular uh, scrum meetings. Let's build that trust. Uh, sorry, sprint meetings. Uh, let's go through the beginning of each of those sections. Let's take that backlog that we had. Let's groom it, which is a slightly nervous word to use, but let's get that together. <laughs> let's work out what we're going to do in the sprint. Let's add other things to it as we need to. Mm. And let's just work through and continuously deliver. But the reality of doing that, especially with a brand new client who doesn't know us, who, who's kind of obviously gone through marketing or maybe referred through to someone else to say here, put down this amount of money to put three, four, one, two devs working on it. And we're not really going to define what you're going to do. We'll just have a rough idea and we'll work that through at the end. There's got to be a big amount of trust to be able to do that. And I think there's, it, it's a very interesting way. And I think we, we see that challenging uh, to actually be able to work in Agile to do that properly. The, and you have an amount of work before you can get into into delivering sprints as well you know a in, in quotes sprint zero yep. you know can have cover a multitude of of activities in terms of defining the product backlog um setting up infrastructure setting up you know setting up devops so you've got build pipelines so that you can then start to actually roll at a velocity within sprints otherwise you you run the risk of saying well actually we we're not actually ready to to commit to delivering sprints because we don't have all of those those preparatory activities completed so i think there is there is it is always a challenge and if you haven't worked with a client before you know that if they haven't worked in an agile environment the misunderstandings well there's there's scope for major misunderstandings from a commercial perspective um, they don't necessarily cause product issues but certainly, oh, well, we're going to spend six weeks, you know, extracting the requirements and building a, a product backlog so that we can then do our first prioritization session to work out what's going to go into sprint one. Yeah, those those are things that are very rarely considered as being, you know, part of that commercial discussion. The, the one one way that I'll be honest, I haven't seen put in there, but feel could work is to, to put in break point clauses that there's got to be trust on both sides that both sides have the opportunity to pull out maybe a, for each sprint. So you have a two or three week sprint. You have the opportunity to say, actually, you're no longer delivering. Um, yeah. And I think, and I think it's, I think that's, I think putting breakpoints in is always a, 
a good idea. I think splitting a commercial engagement into a preparatory, we're going to prepare the mm. backlog. Yeah. And then only after we've done that and we've kind of had that prioritization do we know, well, theoretically, how many sprints we might be looking at to deliver an MVP. Mm. And at that point, then you might be saying, well, actually, the cost of a sprint is X and you know, you're committing to buying this many sprints. And I, I think usually the, the problem's not with the people directly on the team. Uh, it, it's those who haven't engaged day in, day out, who just want to see the, the kind of final outputs, really. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not saying that's a negative thing against them. They just, they're not fully there as the project, so that whether it's the senior managers or people, maybe you're dealing with this, the technology teams and not the direct this, business. Yeah. And that that is often where the issues come from because they want things in black and white a lot more. Depending on the governance requirements. I mean, ten years ago I did the Scrum Master certification and about the same time I did Prince 2 and it was an interesting decision because I couldn't work (laughs) out which one was going to be most useful. But they took the two work together because, you know, you still need to manage the risks and the issues around the delivery of an agile project. And if you are dealing with a procurement organisation, an organisation with a procurement department or a old school waterfall PMO, mm-hmm. then being able to deliver the message in a print to manner around the delivery yeah. of a, an agile project is actually quite an important skill to have and to be able to, to do that translation between the methodologies so that you've got that communication in place. Yeah. And, and it may be the case that you have change requests that hit within those that you do at the beginning uh, or end of each sprint and that those that you accept there will be changes, but you manage those through change requests and it's more fun documentation. And, and those those are commercial change requests then, not yeah. yes. product yeah, change. Absolutely. And I think Sorry. that's a re- it's a really important separation to make because yeah. your agile product backlog and your management of that product backlog remains agile. Mm. But the impact on the number of potential sprints you might be needing to deliver in order to to realise an MVP would be a commercial change. So that change request, that separation and definition of them is really important. Absolutely. And and I think the important thing is to get those, not necessarily tools, but usually tools would be the best way to do it. The, what Gary was talking about with the Azure DevOps or whether you're using Jira, Octopus Deploy, all the things in there to kind of help support what you're doing with that and, and make sure you're tracking it effectively. Because certainly you're far less likely to be in there. You, know, you can see I love my post-it notes up on a board, but generally you're going to be, not everyone is going to be there on site and all co-working together if you're working between a client and consultant uh, side of things. So making sure you have that, that it's visible for everyone and you have you can all agree and, and track things there. There's, there's also uh, like the tools are really good. So Azure DevOps is really good. It gives us all that visibility. It gives us a, a way of working that, you know, I can get a project set up that a developer just has to check in code and we go through some really simple processes. It's all deployed to a dev- development environment, to a test environment. That's all great. The the the, the issues that that I uh, tend to see is where we as dev team are doing the DevOps way, if you like. We're doing lots of small pull requests. With we've, we've, we've got really good velocity, and then we hand it over to another environment for the business to do some testing. And all we've done is we've just done waterfall in in, in an agile way because you're you if you're just going to the dev environment, you're having to hand over then maybe lots of features that need testing, which then would go into maybe a period of two weeks of UAT testing, um, yep. and then it would come back. And it's like the the, the process of, of an agile delivery should go from dev to the to the end person who's going to but get I, the value and, and without I, I disagree slightly there sure. I think what should be done is that we all agree up front we all have that discussion and everyone's on the same page on that note unfortunately we're going to have to move on to another page uh, as we wrap up for this week uh, I think it's been interesting uh, if you just to everyone listening if you want to get involved go onto the website have a look at the upcoming shows if there's a topic that you find interesting uh we, we need to have a proper chat about this actually thinking about it but uh we've opened up the idea to try and have guests on so if we can get some guests coming and joining in with some of these topics 
uh, I think it'd be good to hear from you. So if you do see one of the topics there that you'd like to go down, go and sign up, get old Microsoft Forms on there. Also, uh, if you want to hear us talk about a particular topic, go and put some ideas on there or just drop us a note. Otherwise, uh, I've been grey and slightly bald. Uh, Al's hat is looking very nice and I wish I had a hat and I wish I put a jumper on because I'm freezing at the moment. And Gary, your beard is looking particularly beard, fine yeah, today. Yeah. And congratulations on the new microphone because it's sounding a lot better as well. So based on the feedback, yeah, they are adding value. Continuous to improvement. That's exactly. what I like to see. Yeah, Thank that. you very much, all. <laughs> and uh, same time, two weeks' time. Cheers, guys. It'll be great. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Grey Hat Beard Podcast. The song Drink Up My Mateys was brought to you by Black Bones under a non-commercial attribution license. <laughs>